Hello and welcome to our A Course in Miracles audio book club call. My name is Jared Krebs. Today is November 10th. Ooh, got some feedback there. Okay, today is November 10th, and we are blessed and honored to have Mr. Gary Renard himself on our call today. And just to give you some background of this call and this Zoom uh, group, we actually started about a year ago. And it all started when my wife introduced me to Gary Renard's audiobook called The Disappearance of the Universe, which totally blew my mind in so many ways, opened me up to A Course in Miracles and everything that A Course in Miracles has to offer, namely the end, the dissolving of the ego, letting go of all subconscious guilt, and allow, having so much more freedom in my personal life, my professional life, in all aspects of life that I wanted to create this group so that we could have other people be part of it, create a community. And so that's what this group's all about. And we meet every Friday at 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, and we talk about Gary Renard's audiobooks. And we are blessed and honored to have Gary Renard on the call today. And uh, before we bring Gary on, I just want to acknowledge you for being on, for being a great person that's studying this, for being part of our community. And we want to warm up the call by having everybody uh, just state uh, their name, state your name, where you're calling in from, and why you're excited about today's call. We're going to start with Sherry Bender. All right, Sherry, you're unmuted. Oh. I think there we Hello. go. Okay, oh, thanks. There you go. Thanks, Jared. This is Sherry Bender from San Diego. Awesome. And why are you excited about today's call, Sherry? I love disappearance of the universe and I think more, I guess I'll call it practical application would be helpful. Yes. Okay. So you're wanting practical application and yeah. getting more tips on that from today's call. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks, Jared. All right, let's go to Angela. Can you unmute yourself, Angela? Yes. All right. Hi. Hi. I'm Angela Irving in Austin, Texas, in my car. Um, driving awesome. back from somewhere. I'm excited because I always love the conversations that come out of this group. So, I mean, to have Mr. Gary Renard on is, is exciting. Yay. Thank you, Angela. Good to see your face. Yay, likewise. All right, let's go to Colleen Blair. I just unmuted you, Colleen. Hi, it's me and Rob, my husband, and we're both here. Hi, Rob. Hi. Where are you coming in from, calling in from? Uh, we're from Houston, and we were at the Matagorda with you. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Th thank you for being here, and why are you excited about today's call? Uh, we just like studying this material. It's this wonderful. Trying to learn to live it. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Well, it was awesome meeting you, and I'm excited that you're here. Thank Great. you. Thank you. All right. Let's go to Nathan Lively. Hi, guys. It's Nathan in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I'm excited about today's call because, um, let's see, I always get some good insights and, I don't know, vicariously maybe earn some forgiveness points through listening to other people's stories. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks for being here. All right. Pablo Arango. I just unmuted you. Hey guys. Um, I'm actually calling from Columbia right now. I live in Houston, but uh, I'm here visiting family. So, uh, and uh, I always enjoy uh, listening to Gary and there's always something new to learn and good reminders. Fantastic. Wow. Our first international uh, member here on the call. Thank you, Pablo. Thanks for being here. Thank you for putting awesome. this together. Yes. All right. Let's go to Viola Krebs in Salt Lake City. My mom, I just unmuted you. Uh-oh. I think... She's having technical difficulties. We don't hear you. Yeah, yes, there's no, you can hear me? Okay, good. Um, there's no power here, so I'm, I'm kind of hearing you guys intermittently. Oh, excited I'm because I want to continue with my spiritual journey. Thank you, Mom. I love you. 
Aw, I guess my mom's watching in the dark in Salt Lake City. Way to go, mom. I love it that you're on still. And I know my dad and my wife are both on as well, uh, but they're not able to speak. Um, my dad and my, my wife, I think they're on some other calls as well. So they're kind of in and out. And then we also have someone calling in from area code 562. I just unmuted you, area code 562. Welcome to the call. Hi, I don't know if you're speaking of Donna Dunham. I'm yes. calling from Anaheim, California. Yes, Donna, welcome to the call from Anaheim, California. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to meet others that speak the same language. It's awesome. Oh, it is awesome. Well, it's great to have you. Welcome <laughs> to your first call with us. And um, Thank you. And uh, look forward to chatting with you more even after this webinar. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Fantastic. Okay, so I think we've gone through everyone who's on right now. I'm sure more people will, will be getting on um, as we go through uh, tonight's webinar. But uh, I want to just go ahead, first of all, and thank you, Gary, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to spend time with us today to share um, your insights and, and stories and, and wherever you're led to, wherever the Holy Spirit leads you on this call. Um, we're very grateful that you took time and that you continue to take time for our book club and, and to sow into us. And with that being said, Gary Renard, welcome to the call. Oh, I got to unmute you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Gary Renard, welcome to the call. Hey, thank you, Jared. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I always enjoy talking to you and your family and the book club people and, and everything. And uh, this is a very exciting uh, time for me. It's only, I think, four days till my new book is being released. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really happy about that. And, yes. Uh, and I also have a new website that's being unveiled this weekend. Oh. And uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of new things happening, exciting things happening. You know, I just wanted to mention to uh, Donna in, in Anaheim, uh, Cindy and I are doing a workshop in San Diego in three weeks. So uh, you may want to go to the appearances page of my website and you can get the contact information if you're interested in coming. And uh, I also want to say hi to uh, Pablo because, uh, you know, I, I haven't answered your email yet, but I'm going to. I'm, I'm just running about uh, three weeks behind on my emails. So <laughs> sorry about that. No, no, no worries at all. Yeah. I wasn't expecting an answer anyway. You know, I always express myself. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I really do. And I liked uh, your email very much. And, uh, yeah, these, these are just really exciting times. You know, Cindy's book just came out. Uh, three months ago and is doing really well and uh, so she's excited about that I'm excited about my new book and uh, you know it's just a, a, a very happy time for us right now and uh, you know plus the holiday season is starting and uh, Cindy just loves Christmas I mean I think she starts celebrating Christmas in August you know she's just so into Christmas and we like Thanksgiving too, of course. So uh, th this is the time of year for us when our uh, traveling starts to wind down a little bit. And we don't go to as many places uh, in the winter. And it's also a good time for us to write because uh, personally, I can't write when I'm traveling. It's, uh, it's just too difficult. You're always doing something. There are too many distractions. You're always uh, going somewhere and being with people. And... Uh, I can only write when I'm at home, so uh, the winter is the best time for me. And uh, I may even, you know, before the winter's over, maybe in January, I may even uh, start book number five because uh, uh, it takes a while. You know, the last one took me three years uh, to write, and then it takes another year uh, to get it published because uh, my publisher, Hay House, has a lot of authors. And it takes them a long time to publish a book. You have to kind of like, you know, wait in line for your turn. Uh, so, yeah, maybe uh, starting in January, I'll be working on my fifth book. Awesome. When you write a book, is it like art and in person kind of guiding you what to, to write? Or like how do they impact your writings? Well, they're always uh, the ones who decide uh, if and when there's going to be another book. Uh, there was a year or two where I didn't know if there was going to be a fourth book. I thought that maybe uh, the trilogy, the first three, 
that would be it because they pretty much uh, completed telling their stories about, uh, you know, uh, Thomas and Thaddeus 2,000 years ago, uh, Art and Persa in the future, uh, Cindy and me uh, at this time, and how they all fit together, how those three lifetimes all fit together. And I, I thought maybe they were done. But then I started to get the feeling, and I usually get a feeling if something's going to happen. And I had this intuition that there was going to be a fourth book and that they were going to start appearing to me. So I started to think, well, what do we want this book to be about? And they usually choose that, but I'm thinking, you know, there's something that I've always wanted to ask them that I never got around to ask them. Because when they appear to me, I'm so amazed that they're here that I forget what to ask them. You know, I, sometimes I just totally blank out. And uh, I realized that I had never asked them the question I wanted to about Jesus and Buddha, namely, you know, how did Jesus get to be Jesus? And, and how did Buddha get to be Buddha? And they must have had incarnations before that. So I'm wondering, you know, what were they like? What did they learn? Uh, what were their experiences? And so I did remember this time uh, to ask that. And that became the theme of the book because there were six very important lifetimes that they shared together. And Arden and Persa told me all about them. And so it opened up a whole new subject, uh, teachings that I had never written about before, uh, stories that I had never heard before about Jesus and Buddha. In fact, the world has never heard these stories about Jesus and Buddha because it's never been written about before. And uh, you know, this is the first time, so that makes it exciting also. And uh, I just had a feeling they were going to come back, and they did. And this time, they actually told me that there would be a fifth book. Uh, I didn't put that in the book, in the fourth book. They told me not to, but uh, they did tell me that there was going to be a fifth book. But they said, uh, you know, don't give anybody a time for it or anything, because it's probably going to be, you know, at least three or four years uh, before that happens. And... Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to say to people, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a fifth book, but uh, there's no timeline as to exactly when it's going to be ready. And uh, I think I know the title, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And uh, I'm excited about what it's going to be about. And uh, Art and Teresa, you know, they've never uh, let me down. And they do talk to me in between visits. Uh, you'll notice that for the third book and the fourth, but for the third book, they told me, uh, not to record them. I recorded them for the first two books, which made it a lot easier. Uh, the third and fourth books, I'm relying on notes, I'm relying on my memory, and I'm relying on them correcting me because I do hear them uh, in my mind. And part of the reason that they wanted me to not record them was so that I would get better at hearing them in between visits. Mm -hmm. uh, after they're gone, I could practice more uh, hearing their voice, which is really the voice of the Holy Spirit. But uh, when, when it, was the it, last time you visit or they visited you and, and you saw them like it physically? That was uh, when the book was finished in September of uh, 2016. Uh, so it's been a year and two months since I saw them. And it's been a year and two months since the events in the book uh, were recorded and actually sent the book to Hay House. Uh, in September of 2016, because I kept up with it as I didn't always used to do that. But now I, I try to keep up with them and, and have uh, the chapter about any visit done before they come for the next chapter. That way I don't get so far behind them, you know, under pressure and scrambling and trying to make a deadline. Wow. Which, uh, you know, Hay House, I think pretty much gave up on me ever making a deadline <laughs> because I never did. And, uh, <laughs> And after all, they said, yeah, yeah, okay, so let us know when it's done. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I did. And uh, they're uh, taking even longer now to publish books because uh, they have a little different operation. They have editors now in New York City at a publicity department in New York City. So, uh, you know, it, it's a bigger organization now. And, uh, you know, I told you this in our family conversations, but uh, when I first started with Chaos, they only had about 25, 35 authors. And now it's more like 125, 135 wow. uh, authors. And 
that's happened in the last uh, 13 years since I've been with them. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a pretty big uh, operation now. And it's a little cumbersome, so you have to kind of like be patient with each other. You have to be patient with them, they have to be patient with me, and it, it works out pretty good. But uh, as far as the fifth book, I I, I can't uh, talk about the details yet, but I'm excited about it. And I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty positive there's going to be a fifth book. And I could start it as soon as uh, January. January, okay. So so tell us about the fourth book or wherever you want to take this conversation. I know other people have questions too, so whenever you want to open it up to questions, um, the floor is yours. Well, with uh, the fourth book, you know, Arden and Persa have uh, kind of a way of hitting people over the head with a sledgehammer when it comes to uh, the teachings and being non-compromising and uncompromising about the teachings. And they did that this time, especially in regard to the subject of Mm -hmm. non-dualism. In the lifetimes that, uh, the most relevant lifetimes, because Jesus and Buddha actually knew each other in about 40 different lifetimes, which isn't, yeah, which isn't that unusual for us because Arden and Persa have explained how people kind of like travel uh, together in groups. Yeah. You know, kind of like schools of fish, you know, they, they stick together, they're, they're in this huge ocean, yet they pretty much stay together in uh, the ocean. And that's what people are like, too. It's like uh, we travel in groups. Uh, another way that they put it was that we're in each other's orbit. You know, that's why we keep coming back together. And uh, we keep seeing each other and knowing each other and sometimes knowing each other well in various lifetimes. And with Jesus and Buddha, what they talked about in the fourth book was the six lifetimes that were the most relevant in regard to spirituality. And those are the lifetimes that occurred uh, toward the time that they were kind of like winding up their visits uh, to earth, their earthly lifetimes. So the last uh, six visits that they knew each other, those are the ones that are the focus of this book. And during those six lifetimes, one of them was in uh, Japan, about 700 BC, and uh, they were Shintos, and uh, they studied Shintoism, and they were both in love with the same woman, which was kind of interesting. So you got these two friends, good friends, who are in love with the same woman, and that was a forgiveness opportunity, as was uh, Japanese culture in general, because back (laughs) in those days, you were literally owned by the emperor. You know, you were, as a person, you were considered to be the emperor's personal property. And you had to do whatever the royal family told you to do. And that made life very difficult for a lot of people. And this is covered and their forgiveness lessons are covered and a little bit of Shintoism and the things that they uh, did and studied are covered in the book. Uh, the second lifetime is a lifetime that they spent uh, in China and they studied with Lao Tzu. Now, they studied with these great teachers. They got to study with these great teachers because they themselves were so spiritually advanced. You know, they were almost on the level of their teachers already, you know, even uh, in these lifetimes. They would, yes, they went to learn from these teachers, but they knew almost as much as the teachers did. But they would pick up some useful uh, things along the way. And uh, in that lifetime in China, uh, they were actually uh, lovers. They had a romantic uh, relationship in that lifetime. Uh, the third lifetime I discovered, they were Hindus uh, in India, and uh, they uh, actually were uh, cousins in that lifetime. And, uh, you know, all these various teachings are, you know, discussed to a certain degree. Uh, this book is not meant to be an in-depth discussion of the various teachings, but they do cover uh, some of it, and I'm going to get to why in a moment, but I just wanted to tell you that the fourth lifetime uh, was, well, actually the third lifetime was, yeah, Hindus. The fourth lifetime was with Plato at Plato's Academy in Greece. They were friends in that lifetime. They were both fellow students at uh, Plato's Academy, and some of what Plato said is, is also touched. And uh, they actually have a little dialogue in that chapter between the two people who were students of Plato and also between them and Plato. So there are actually uh, some discussions 
in that chapter. The fifth lifetime that they knew each other where they were living a spiritual lifetime was at the time of Buddha. And at that time, uh, Buddha, who was named uh, Siddhartha at that time, uh, he was not named uh, Gautama, which many people think that his name was uh, Gautama at that time. But Arden Versus said, no, uh, that wasn't his name. His name was uh, Siddhartha. And it turned out, and this was very interesting uh, to me, because it's not ge generally recognized by the Buddhist religion that Buddha had a son. Yet it has always been kind of like thought by a certain group of people that he did have a son. And Arden Persa confirmed that uh, in this chapter. And uh, it turns out that the person that was Buddha's son was uh, Jesus. <laughs> he was actually Buddha's son in that lifetime. And uh, they would be together again for one more lifetime. And uh, Buddha actually did come back. And I thought it was interesting because uh, most people assume that that was Buddha's final lifetime. And he did awaken from the dream in that lifetime. But he also came back one more time because he did not really acknowledge God uh, in that lifetime. And you'll see at the end of uh, the chapter uh, at Buddha's time, you'll see at the very end that they both knew this, that both Buddha and Jesus knew that they were coming back one more time that they were going to acknowledge God. And Buddha says to his, his son, who is uh, Jesus, who's named something else in that uh, lifetime, uh, he says to him, next time you be the teacher. <laughs> you know, so he actually said to uh, Jesus, you know, next time you, I'm not gonna be the teacher, you be the teacher. And, uh, and so uh, Buddha in that final lifetime had a pretty quiet life. And I'm not gonna tell you exactly who he was in that lifetime, you have to read the book. Uh, who he was in his final lifetime. But uh, it was a big surprise to me, and it kind of like went along with something that Arden Persa said in the first book. Uh, in The Disappearance of the Universe, they actually said that Buddha went on to live uh, one more lifetime, and that he actually achieved his final lifetime and, and final degree of enlightenment uh, in that next lifetime, which most people wouldn't know about. And I had no idea when they told me that. This was back in the 1990s when they told me that. And I had no idea that they were actually gonna be telling me about it someday and that I'd be writing it in a book. You know, so it's funny how things work out. You know, things always seem to kind of like come full circle and they bring me all the way back to the disparity of the universe and uh, bring up things like uh, they cover the subjects of dualism and uh, kind of like semi-dualism and non-dualism and pure non-dualism. They bring that back from the first book and expound on it in the fourth book and get more detailed. And uh, they're really uncompromising about it. And what they do is they kind of like take all these lifetimes together and they point out that the great teachers of history, the teachers that Jesus and Buddha got to study with, as well as Buddha and Jesus uh, themselves, they point out that they were all teaching non-dualism. You know, even Plato was saying that there is a reality that doesn't change. You know, it doesn't shift or change, which of course Miracles also says. And uh, you know, Plato said some very interesting things. In the end, he he kept making the world real for some reason, but yet at the same time, he knew that there was a reality that was unseen that didn't waver. That was a constant. And that is a theme that you see from all of these great teachers. You know, you, you got the, you know, the four great teachers that I mentioned, plus Jesus and Buddha, all six of them were uh, saying, look, there's what you are seeing, which is an illusion, it's a dream. And there is a reality just beyond the illusion. There is a reality that is just beyond the veil, but it's everywhere. And it's here now, uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. You can see Jesus saying the same thing in uh, the Gospel of Thomas, you know, 2,000 years ago. He says, uh, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and people do not see it. You know, so there's a reality that's here right now, and it's totally in harmony with what the Course says about the fact that we never actually left heaven. Uh, we're still there, but we're having this dream. 
You know, so we never left heaven. We're just having a dream that we left heaven, which is why A Course in Miracles says you are at home in God dreaming of exile, but perfectly capable of awakening to reality. So that reality is actually here right now. And people do not see it because it's out of their awareness. So when the Course talks about removing the blocks to the awareness of uh, love's presence, which is your natural inheritance, I really like to emphasize to people, and it bears repeating, that you know, A Course in Miracles is a very big teaching. And when it talks about removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance, it's not talking about your everyday human kind of love. It's talking about nothing less than the kingdom of heaven, you know, the kingdom of God. That's what it's talking about. It's a very big uh, kind of a teaching. And removing the blocks, well, that's undoing the ego. You know, the Course says salvation is undoing. In order to experience your natural inheritance, you have to do away with that which is blocking it. And what's blocking your experience of it is the ego. So uh, salvation is undoing. The Course is about undoing the ego. And what Arden and Percy do in the fourth book is they really point out that these other teachers were also saying, look, you've got reality and you've got unreality. And nothing about unreality is true. It's an illusion. It's totally false. It has no reality whatsoever. Then you have a reality that has to be chosen by the mind in order to experience it. So uh, a lot of these teachers were teaching the same thing. And then what happens is that when that teacher dies, when that teacher passes away, you have uh, the first or second generation of their students who start to change the message. You know, they start to change it to a worldly message. They start bringing it into the world, making it about the world. They start slowly but surely, every single time, they start making the world real and they start getting away from the original message. Now, fortunately, with A Course in Miracles, that's not going to happen. Even though people are already doing it uh, and people have been trying to change the Course and say that you know, oh, it doesn't really mean that. It doesn't really mean that there is no world. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really mean uh, what it's saying. Well, it does mean what it's saying. And uh, as long as we have the course, you know, this is why, uh, you know, Jesus, I think he waited until we could understand some of the things that he's talking about so that they could be demonstrated by quantum physics and by Freud and Jung and uh, matched up with these Eastern ideas that have been integrating into Western society. Uh, especially since the 1970s, which is when the course was published. And uh, I think he waited until the right time when people could start to say, well, you know, you know, maybe this is true because quantum physics is saying the same thing. You know, the universe can't be here. You know, it's not possible. And uh, Jesus says things in the course like that's not them and they can't be there. You know, he's literally saying that what we're seeing is not true. And uh, this book is kind of like a cautionary tale because it's reminding students, you know, it's reminding Course in Miracles students, but everybody in the New Age community, that you can't compromise on the teachings or else as soon as you change them, it's not true anymore. So uh, A Course in Miracles, as you know, is relentlessly uncompromising throughout its whole uh, half a million words. And this book is saying to its students, look, don't do what everybody else has done in the past. Don't take this and change it and, you know, make it about the world and making the world real. You know, don't go that way like everybody else has uh, in the past. This time, you know, stick to the message. Stay with it. Don't change it. And uh, I don't see how anybody could read this fourth book and not want to stick to the message of A Course in Miracles. I mean, you know, they, they'd have to be blind, you know, to not see what art and person, they're so clear about it in this book. And they're saying, look, don't slip back into dualism. Uh, stay with non-dualism. And in the case of the Course of Miracles, in the, that final lifetime of Jesus and Buddha, uh, stick with pure non-dualism, which is God. Uh, that's the only difference between non-dualism and pure non-dualism, is that with pure non-dualism, you recognize God as the only source as the only reality. And that's the difference because other forms of non-dualism in the past uh, have not recognized God as reality. 
And A Course in Miracles is very clear that God is the only reality, which is why it says be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. So, uh, you know, if you're up for it, and, and not everybody is, but if you're up for it, then uh, you don't have to be uh, a religious type believer. You're simply recognizing God. You know, at one point, Arden Persa said to me, you know, how can you undo the idea of separation from God without acknowledging God? You know, how can you do that? You can't do it. You can't undo the separation from God without acknowledging God, without uh, saying that God is the source, you know, that God is the one reality. And not everybody has done that. In fact, most people have not done that. Even uh, Christians make the world real. So God is not the only reality. Uh, there's God and then there's all this other stuff too. And of course, miracles is very specific about the saying that this other stuff is not true. You know, that what you're seeing is not true. And the reason that that is so essential to A Course in Miracles is because it, it kind of like brings forth a different kind of forgiveness. You know, it brings forth a kind of forgiveness that does not make the error real. It overlooks the error. And that's the primary difference between A Course in Miracles and everything else. That now you can forgive people not because they've really done something, you can forgive people because they haven't really done anything. Uh, the Course says forgiveness does not pardon sins and make them real. It sees there was no sin, and in that view are all your sins forgiven. I might add that only in that view are your sins forgiven because of that great law of the mind in the Course. As you see him, you will see yourself. If you think they really did it, then you're gonna think that you really did it and that you're guilty of everything that you think that you've ever done in every lifetime that you've ever you know, experienced here. Or they're innocent, which would mean that you're innocent and they're innocent because they haven't really done anything because this is just a dream. That's what makes you innocent because you haven't really done anything either. And that's essential to the Course's brand of forgiveness. You can't do the Course without acknowledging that God is the only reality and without acknowledging that what you're seeing here uh, seemingly on earth is not true, that it's just a dream. Uh, the Course uh, says the miracle, which is the kind of forgiveness that I'm talking about. It says the miracle establishes that you dream a dream and that its content is not true. And the Course is so specific about these things. And people always try to get around it. And they always try to bring it into the world. And they're still trying to make the world real. You know, the Course says there is no world. And then they take the Holy Spirit and they put the Holy Spirit in the world, doing things in the world. And if there's no world, I would like to know what world they think the Holy Spirit is operating in. You know, there's no world for the Holy Spirit to be doing things in. You know, so he's not doing things in the world. He's doing things in your mind. You know, he's counseling you to undo the ego, to undo and overlook the illusion, overlook the dream, and connect with this reality that is beyond the dream, but is everywhere, and that we never actually left. And in that view, we're all innocent. None of us have really done anything. And Art and Hirsch are saying in this fourth book, don't get away from that. Don't do it. People are already doing, you know, you get people starting churches based on the course. And I recognize that people are going to do that because, you know, they want to have a place to have their funerals and they want to have a place to, you know, have their babies Christian and, and things like that. And in that sense, uh, churches are a positive force uh, in society. Churches do a lot of good for society, but you're not going to find God there. You're going to find God within which is why at the end of the day, spirituality is a very personal thing. Yes, you know, between you and God or you and the Holy Spirit, you and Jesus, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, it's personal and God is found within you and not any place that you're looking at. And uh, I think that th this book is important because of that. It's important because of the way that it emphasizes the non-compromising nature of pure non-dualism and how important it is to stick to that philosophy in order to do the Course's brand of forgiveness. So on that note, uh, if anybody 
who is uh, you know watching and listening would like to ask uh, a question, I'd be happy you know to answer them. All right, guys, here's your opportunity to ask Gary Renard a question. You can unmute yourself or even type it in the chat and I could read it. But who has a question? If you don't have any questions, I have jokes. Let's start with a joke. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll tell you one, you know, uh, Pablo and Jared just heard this in, uh, in Metagorda in, in Texas, but I'll tell it for the, those of you who haven't heard it. Uh, this Buddhist is walking in Central Park, right? And the Buddhist sees a hot dog vendor. So he goes up to the hot dog vendor and the Buddhist says, make me one with everything. You know, so, you know, the hot dog vendor gets that, uh, you know, the, the Buddhist is giving him a line and uh, you know, kind of like making fun with him. But he makes the Buddhist uh, his hot dog and you know, he puts everything on it, gives it to the uh, Buddhist. The Buddhist pays for the hot dog. Then the Buddhist asks the hot dog vendor for his change. And the hot dog vendor says, ah, you know, change comes from within. So uh, that's good because, you know, in New York City, you have to have a comeback. You can't just let somebody go. You know, you have to have a, a smart ass uh, comeback. So that's why so the, the hot Buddhist, dog vendor. So the Buddhist never got his change. No. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. Oh, we have a question. All right. Hi, Jared. Yes. Nathan, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yes. Cool. Hey, guys. So, a um, little abstract, but I've been having sort of an a ongoing conversation with my wife about whether or not being in a healthy emotional relationship with someone means that you feel the same emotions that they do. So, if they get sad, then it's appropriate to be sad with them. And um, if they're feeling, whatever their feeling is, then the way that you are appropriate and sympathetic is to also like have some of that. And I didn't realize till we started talking about that, that I feel kind of the opposite, that I should be from a place of strength and like, I see that you're feeling sad, but um, and I'm sort of like doing my forgiveness lesson and not like saying that, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, like, well, I realize that sadness isn't real and this whole thing isn't real and you're not even here and I'm not here. And therefore like you're forgiven, I'm forgiven. And so I'm thinking, I'm trying to think right minded thoughts and like not kind of like go down the well of being emotional with them whenever I'm with someone like that. And so I wonder if I wonder if you have any thoughts on this, Gary. I guess I'm not trying to have you choose whether or not one of us is right and the other one's wrong. I'm just wondering, is it inappropriate is it appropriate to not get emotional when someone else is emotional? Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question. I think most course miracle students have to deal with that at times. Uh, Nathan, I recognize your name, by the way. I've seen you on Facebook and emails and things like that. So it's good to have a face to go with the name. Uh, Hi, Gary. You hey. and I met a long time ago. Yeah. Where was it that we met? I forget. At the crossings in Austin. Cool. Yeah. I gave you what, some tips about year? your microphone. What year? I don't know, Jared. God, it was a long time ago, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a few years since uh, they closed. No. Like, Are they closed? I didn't even yeah. know that. Yeah, I used to like uh, doing things there, but they they uh, sold the place and it became kind of like a a retreat for rich people, you know. Oh and, shoot! Okay. <laughs> kind of like a you know a sauna and a, you know kind of like re rejuvenation type place for the wealthy. But right. uh, yeah, you know, I can relate to your question because I'm you know I've been married for uh, eight years to Cindy. And uh, I'm fortunate to be with her because she, uh, she's not a drama queen. You know, she, uh, she's very even uh, tempered. She doesn't get overly emotional very much. And she's just happy. She's a happy person. Uh, and she's having a happy dream. And, and I'm very uh, lucky in that sense. And, uh, 
before I answer your question, I just want to point out that I tell people, you know, because sometimes guys will ask me, well, you know, uh, do you have any advice? You know, I, I haven't found my soulmate yet. You know, can you give me any advice on that? And uh, I tell them, look, first of all, uh, if you're going to be in a relationship with someone, be in a relationship with someone who is easy to get along with. You know, because I was in a relationship for a long time with a woman who was not easy uh, to get along with. She's very difficult. And today we're the best of friends, so uh, I'm not, you know, criticizing her or anything. I'm, I'm just saying that I know the difference. And if you want to be happy, you know, be with somebody who is easy to get along with, somebody who smiles, you know, somebody who is happy, somebody uh, who will, you know, bring joy uh, to life. And you'll be a much happier person being with somebody like that than being with somebody who is work. You know, or, you know it's like work to be with them. And, uh, you know, that's the advice that I usually give people. And then once you're uh, in a relationship with somebody, then I tell people uh, the same thing that I tell them about a lot of other subjects, which is don't forget how to be normal. You know, you don't always have to be, you know, so damn honest. You, you don't always have to be so damn spiritual all the time. You know, it's okay to empathize with people. Yeah, you know that it's not real. And maybe they know that it's not real. But uh, you're still going to get sad if somebody who you love dies. You're still going to, uh, you know, get upset once in a while. Uh, unless, you know, you're on the same level as Jesus. And, you know, you're communicating with them so clearly at the level of the mind that you know for sure that they're still alive, even though they appear to have died, because nobody ever really dies. But most people don't know that. So, you know, I say, look, it's okay to uh, empathize with people. Uh, now, we know that true empathy, according to the Course, is relating to people on the level of spirit, you know, to engaging in spiritual sight, uh, to seeing with what the Course calls vision. Uh, we know that that's reality and that that's the way that we should think. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you don't behave in a normal way. You know, if somebody dies, you don't go into the funeral and say, hey, what you brought them? Don't you know it's all an illusion? You know, I mean, that would be, uh, you know, kind of uh, stupid in the sense that where's the love? You know, uh, you can be loving and you can be kind to people, even when they are sad and empathize with them. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going against your beliefs because you still know what the truth is. But at the same time, you're being kind and you're being loving uh, to kind of like acknowledge, you know, you don't have to act sad yourself if you're not sad, but you want to acknowledge their sadness and what they're going through. And yeah, I can appreciate that because it's I kind of give them a little bit of what they're asking for and what they need. And that doesn't mean I have to compromise on my own beliefs. That's right. You know, and it's like uh, anything else. If you're if you have a job and you're on the job, you do your job. Now you know that it's not real. You know that it's uh, you know just a movie, so to speak. And uh, the Holy Spirit is right there with you, telling you that. But it doesn't mean that you don't do your job. <laughs> you know, you still do your job, and you do it the best you can. So that's really a good example of how you can relate to people. You know, you do it uh, in a way that is kind and loving. That's the most important thing. And, uh, you know, in doing so, maybe you'll uh, emphasize with that person, you don't have to cry and you don't have to act sad, but you can acknowledge their sadness and be kind to them when they're in that kind of a state. All right. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. Hey, I want to bring back the Gary Renard podcast, so let me know if you ever need help with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, Gene is going to be well enough soon to start doing that again. We did about 55 of those uh, podcasts uh, and people can, I guess they can still hear them, but uh, yeah, you can, but I would like to uh, start doing that again. I, I was going to call Gene this week and see what he's up to. I'm actually uh, thinking of going to Florida in uh, March to visit my brother, Paul. And uh, if I do that, maybe we'll drive up to Fort Lauderdale. Well, Gene is actually in Boca Raton and uh, Maybe I'll visit him, you know, see how he's doing. Maybe okay. I can con convince him to uh, start doing the podcast again. I know he was having trouble with his eyes. Mm -hmm. I think his other health problems were getting better, but then all of a sudden he started having some pretty bad problems with his eyes. So uh, I'll have to catch up with him and, you know, see if 
see if he's up for it, see if he can do the podcast again. If he can't, then uh, I'll probably find a way to start doing the podcast again. Uh, with yeah. Him. There have been a couple of volunteers, people who have volunteered to, to uh, record the podcast and do so it. Good. So uh, I think, you know, within a few months, either way, there will be podcast again. Cool. And uh, I want to remind everybody to go to my new website, GaryRenard.com. It still has the same address, but uh, it has a new design and, and some new information, and there'll be continuously more new information. And uh, I think it's really cool. I'd, I'd like to know what other people think of it, but I think it's a really good uh, website. And uh, it's the first change that I've made to the design of the website in uh, 13 years. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. And I just say it looks cool. So it's fun to be cool again. Oh, yeah. It looks awesome. I just threw it up on my phone. We're still working out the bugs. But, but uh, I think everything will be working by Saturday or Sunday, hopefully. Yeah, beautiful. Nice picture in your Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. Yeah, we went to Hawaii twice this year. And uh, man, it, was, it was fantastic. It was just uh, great visits, great trips. I think our next retreat in Hawaii is going to be next uh, July, probably on the island of Kauai. In fact, uh, we've never done a retreat on the island of Kauai. And a lot of people have expressed interest. It's a very mystical place, mm -hmm. uh, very striking. And uh, we were there uh, on the cruise just a few weeks ago. And uh, we went by the Nepali coast, which is uh, really really amazing so uh we're going to talk to somebody uh next week about doing that in fact maybe we just need a venue we need to find a place you know to have it and okay. if we can do that then we'll definitely do it there great uh, who, else, who else has a question okay so i have a question while everyone's thinking of their question um i've been reading uh, i'm in chapter 17 right now of uh the the text of a course in miracles and it's been talking about the holy instant and how the Holy Instant kind of transcends time and, and um, brings the Holy Spirit into it. And, and you know, it's like all I'm here seeing is Holy Instant all the time. So could you just explain to me in your interpretation or ask Art and Persa to explain us to all of us, what is the Holy Instant? Okay. Yeah, chapter 17, that was a bad chapter. You shouldn't be reading that. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just joking. I, I asked... Uh, Ken a question about one of his books once. I said, well, Ken, here on your, in your book here on page uh, 234, he said, oh, page 234, that was a bad page. <laughs> you shouldn't ask me anything from that page. <laughs> he was joking. But uh, yeah, the holy instant is more simple than most people realize. You know, some of the ideas in the course are actually pretty simple, but they're too simple for people to grasp because they want everything to be complicated. And uh, the holy instant is simply that instant when you uh, choose once again, as the Course would put it, you know, that instant when you choose the Holy Spirit as your teacher instead of the ego. So it's kind of like that moment that you switch from being in your ego and thinking with the ego to your right mind. And now you're thinking with the Holy Spirit. Now you're choosing the right teacher for a change. And uh, you can't really do both at once. You know, people will always try to integrate the two. And when you do that, you see what happens. You end up with something like the Bible, where you got the Holy Spirit speaking on one page, and you got the ego speaking on the next page. You know, and, and you know, on one page, God is love, and on, on the next page, he's a killer. <laughs> you know, and that's what happens when you try to integrate uh, the Holy Spirit and the ego. And the Course is saying, no, you can't put the two together. You have to choose one or the other. And whichever one you invest your belief in will be what you believe is real. So either heaven is real or this is real, and this is hell, according to the Course, because anything that is in heaven is hell. Uh, the Course says that what we're experiencing here isn't even life. You know, it says there is no life outside of heaven. You know, where God created life, there life must be. So uh, the holy instant is just that instant, which is very important because that's when you choose uh, the Holy Spirit. That's when you choose uh, the Course is vision, and that's when you choose to think of people as not being people, but think of them as being what they really are, 
and where they really are, which is this immortal spirit that is actually perfect oneness. And that's how the Holy Spirit thinks. The Holy Spirit thinks in terms of oneness. And if you want to return to spirit in your reality, in your experience, then you want to think the way that the Holy Spirit thinks. And the Holy Spirit thinks in terms of oneness, uh, innocence everywhere. The Course says everywhere he looks, he sees himself. So now we're overlooking the illusion, we're overlooking the body. So we, we see people acting insanely, you know, especially on television. You know, it seems like there's always somebody shooting 20 people or 50 people somewhere. And, uh, you know, what we've learned to do is we acknowledge, first of all, that those people who look like victims are actually uh, spirit and that what they really are uh, can never be killed. Uh, they can never die, that they will go on forever in heaven and we will be with them as one in heaven. And I think that when we think of people that way, it makes it real for ourselves. We acknowledge on a deeper level that that's where we are, that we are spirit and that we're going to spend eternity, which means no time. There's no such thing as time. You know, even now the idea of being there forever, that's a time-based idea. It implies a long time. And uh, eternity actually means no time, that there isn't any uh, such thing as time. So uh, there's just the experience. And it's just that. And that's it. Nothing happens next. And you don't want anything to happen next because it, it's so great, it's so perfect. You know, I, I doubt if anybody who is having the peak of a perfect sexual orgasm, I doubt if they're thinking, oh, gee, I'd like to have something happen next. You know, I, I don't want this. I want something else. Uh, no, there is no next. And, uh, yeah, there's this confusing thing that seems to be a dream that appeared to happen. And then even that never happened, <laughs> according to the Course. So uh, it's it's the way home. It's kind of like the way back to the experience of perfect one is to acknowledge that what we thought happened never occurred. And that's why it's totally forgivable. But in order to do that, you have to practice the Holy Instant. You have to choose the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead you to forgiveness that doesn't make it real. If you're making it real, that's not forgiveness. You know, the, if you're making it real and then forgive it, the Course is saying, no, you have made it real. And so you cannot forgive it. So the Course is saying, once again, forgiveness does not pardon sins and make them real. You know, it sees there was no sin. So uh, you have to be coming from that place if you're thinking with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will give you right-minded ideas like that and lead you to vision. You know, lead you to the kind of spiritual sight that acknowledges a person's reality, which has uh, absolutely nothing to do with the world or the body. Thank you. I wanted to, um, I just wanted to mention something uh, real quick that uh, while Gary was, was saying all that, it kind of reminded me that it, it's helped me. Um, I think one of the most difficult um, things or one of the things that kind of uh, prevents us from I guess getting things in an experiential way is kind of um, transcending what God actually is. Cause we're so, you know, as, as since we're all dominated by the ego, um, you know, when we start and, and throughout the process until we invert the whole thing uh, completely, uh, we always see a God that is out there, you know, like God is something that's external and, and alien to us. Yeah. And one, one of the things that that's actually helped me a lot and when it, it was one of those aha moments when I got it was understanding that, that God is actually the natural state of who you are as mind. So it's like when you go through and you think, well, what is spirit? Well, spirit is the natural state of being of, of, of the one mind that exists. And that one mind is you. And spirit is perfect oneness and perfect love. And so God is a synonym of perfect spirit. So what God is, is actually the natural state of who you as the one mind is. So it is the one mind that is seemingly, tra seemingly trapped in a state of illusion and dreaming all this thing. And so I think transcending, transcending that concept, it really helps because it brings it closer. Like, oh, well, God is not 
it's not an outside force. There's, there's nobody that's outside of me. That's actually my natural state of being. And I just merely need to awaken to it. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that because that, that helped me um, tremendously when, when, and it may sound weird the way I said it, but maybe it clicks for somebody. No, it doesn't sound uh, weird at all. In fact, you just gave me an experience because you reminded me that I am God. And, uh, you know, people don't go around saying that, yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't advise them to, but uh, it's like, uh, that's not arrogant, according to A Course in Miracles. You know, I, we've already uh, said in, in other places that arrogance is actually thinking that you can be separate from God. And the experience that you just gave me, it's like, oh, it reminded me that I am God, because if we are perfect oneness, then we're all God, but we're that god that's in a state of perfect oneness and i i just had a feeling oh wait a minute that's that's me god isn't outside of me somewhere i, th I think it was ken or or maybe it was you or, or art and, and person in one of the books that um essentially just clarifies that the reason why the course you know kind of uses and talks about god and always talks about god and, and a son is because when you're starting out the process of awakening, it's very easy for the ego to be tempted to say, oh, well, I'm God, so so I'm God. So I don't have to do anything because I'm God. So that's right. why there's always that difference and that caution. And there's, you know, and that uses the, the dualistic words of God and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Trinity is just so to prevent that, that, uh, that temptation from the ego to just say, well, I'm God, so what am I going to worry about it? Um, but that's the reality is that God is just a, our natural state of being is the Christian word for, for the true self who we truly are. Yeah, I think what you're saying is, uh, absolutely true. And, uh, you know, it's like, we have to be honest about our experience. Yes, we are God as one, but that's not our experience. Mm -hmm. our, our experience is that we're here. <laughs> Yeah. And, and we think that we're here. We're not here, but we think that we are. And the only way to get away from that and have a true experience of our oneness with God is through undoing the ego. So I think we have to be honest about that. that there are Course in Miracles students who I've met who they just want to skip to the end. You know, they, they don't want to do the forgiveness work. They just want to say, I'm enlightened, you know, I'm God, and I don't have to do anything like you were saying. And it doesn't work. And uh, there's no way around it. You've you got to do your forgiveness work. You've got to undo the ego. And if you do that, you will get the results that the course is directed toward. So uh, we just have a couple of minutes uh, left if anybody else uh, would like one, to ask. One more question. Anybody else? We have time for one last question. How about you, Jared? Do you have one? Well, going back to chapter 17, um, the, uh, the special relationship talks about the special relationship and how the special relationship is the ego's number one defense. And, um, you know, I know that I'm supposed to be normal and I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not going to just give up all my special relationships or tell everyone to go fly a kite or anything like that. But um, can you comment a little bit about special relationships and just um, what they are and, and how the ego uses them? Sure. There's uh, one very important uh, fundamental difference between a special relationship and a holy relationship. And once again, it's not that complicated. It's actually very simple. The Course says very specifically that the holy relationship is the forgiven relationship. So if you really forgive someone, if you can really acknowledge that, you know, they haven't done anything and that's why they're innocent and what they really are is not a body, but spirit, then that's a holy relationship. And the other person doesn't have to agree with you. You know, they can agree with you later. You know, everyone's going to agree eventually because everyone's going home. But uh, in the illusion of time, not everyone's going to agree with everybody at the same time. So your job is, is to forgive them. And if you forgive them, you're having a holy relationship with them. And the special relationship is simply a relationship that is used for the ego's uh, purposes to reinforce the idea of separation. And uh, 
you can still do the same things that you would normally do in a special relationship. The only difference is, is that you're forgiving it. And a lot of the time, there won't be anything to forgive. But when there is something to forgive, you can do so. Uh, we all have what uh, you know, Ken Watkins called special love bargains. You know, we're in a relationship with somebody and we expect them to do certain things. You know, we, we expect them to behave in a certain way. It could be social, it could be sexual, it could be, uh, you know, uh, any number of things. But uh, we expect certain things from people who we are in a, a special relationship with. And if they don't supply those things, then there's trouble. You know, so uh, what the holy relationship does is if they don't supply those things, the holy relationship forgives. You know, so uh, you forgive them regardless of whether or not they're doing what you want them to do. And, uh, you know, the Course describes the special relationships of the world as childishly egocentric. And uh, yet it's okay. It's okay to be childishly egocentric if you know that you're doing it. You know, I mean, Ken used to say, uh, you know, if you're looking at it with your right mind and you know that you're acting foolishly, then you're not doing it with your ego. You're doing it with the Holy Spirit because you know that you're acting foolishly and that you're being silly and you can laugh at it, you know, and, and that's looking at it with uh, the Holy Spirit. So we have the holy instant where we choose the Holy Spirit. We have um, the relationship that is seen with forgiveness, which is the holy relationship. And you can still act like you're in a special relationship and, you know, uh, have fun and have a good time. You know, uh, you know, it's okay to go out, you know, Cindy and I, and by the way, I want to uh, tell your mom this. Uh, Cindy and I went to see a movie last night uh, it's a new movie with a lot of spiritual healers uh, in the movie. And the, the movie is simply called Healing. And uh, it was very good. And it has all kinds of teachers in it. It's not A Course in Miracles. But uh, it had a lot of sensible things in it about healing and about the importance of thought and the importance of the mind. And, uh, yeah, I would write down the name of it, Healing, and I would watch for it. I think your mom would really like it. And it, uh, you know, it's very relevant to what she's going through at this time. And I think that she'll be able to relate to a lot of the people who, who are in the movie, including the person who directed the movie, and she's in it too. And uh, you know, a lot of the very uh, intelligent healers are uh, in that movie. And uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's good to see that there's a lot of uh, sane thinking out there because. You know, if you watch the news, you would think that the whole world has gone crazy. And the whole world hasn't gone crazy. Just about half of it has gone crazy. <laughs> and that's duality. You know, that's duality itself. When you have uh, people who are in their wrong mind and people who are in their right mind. Uh, that's a perfect example of the yin and the yang and uh, all of these polarities and opposites and dualities that appear to exist uh, in the world. And all that we have to do is switch to the Holy Spirit and see it through the mind of the Holy Spirit and forgive. And not only will we be more peaceful, but we're making a contribution to world peace in the sense that, uh, you know, we all eventually have to change that inner condition in order for the outer condition to be transformed into peace. Uh, that will happen someday. You know, you will have peace on earth someday. Uh, but by the time that happens, it'll be toward the end of the human race. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it'll be, uh, you know, something where uh, there won't be any conflict in the world because there won't be any conflict in the mind. And that's where all conflict originates and that's where all peace originates. So we're doing our part by choosing the Holy Spirit and practicing forgiveness. And we're actually making a contribution uh, to world peace. And, uh, you know, we, like I like to say, you know, we don't have anything better to do. So. <laughs> Uh, why not join in and, uh, you know, let the Holy Spirit be the boss? And it doesn't mean that you have to tell people that you're not the boss, but you know that you're letting the Holy Spirit lead the way. Absolutely. We have one last question. Is that okay? Sure. All right. We have Raylan Rushton in – where are you calling in from, Raylan? I'm in Utah this week. Awesome. All right. What's your question for Gary? Hey, Gary, along the lines of forgiveness, I just, I'm curious how you would answer this because I get this question a lot from a lot of people, a lot of my clients, as well as my students. Um, 
in regards to forgiveness, forgiving other people, you explain that beautifully there. What about forgiving yourself? Like, what would you say about going, going about that? How would the easiest way or some recommendations about forgiving self? Well, the uh, dynamic of forgiving yourself uh, really isn't any different than the dynamic of forgiving somebody else because you are not that body that you identify with. You know, so uh, let's say as you're feeling down on yourself and you're blaming yourself, you know, people who project their unconscious guilt onto others, they tend to have a lot of resentment. Uh, people who project their unconscious guilt onto their own body, onto themselves, they tend to have a lot of regrets and they tend to be depressed and uh, think negatively about themselves and have a poor self-image. And what you want to do is just like the same dynamic of forgiving somebody else, you want to realize that when you think that way, you're thinking with the ego. That's how the ego wants you to think. The ego does not have a high opinion of you. Uh, the ego has a very poor opinion of you. The Holy Spirit has a much higher opinion of you than even you do. So what you got to do is notice that you're thinking with the ego and stop it. And that's also the first step in forgiving somebody else. But now you've got to notice that you're judging yourself. And you've got to stop it because that's the ego. You're thinking with the ego. Uh, whenever you don't feel well, whenever you're feeling depressed, whenever you're judging yourself, that's the ego. And you need to recognize that you're thinking with the ego and stop it. And then when you stop thinking with the ego, you can do the second step, which is the holy instant. You know, now you're thinking with the right teacher. Now you can ask yourself, well, wait a minute. What does the Holy Spirit think about me? You know, I know what the ego thinks about me. Uh, what does the Holy Spirit think about me? And I love that part of the course where it describes the Holy Spirit as kind of like a higher court, you know, kind of like the Supreme Court. You know, the, the course says, appeal everything that you believe about yourself to the higher court. The higher court will throw out the case against you. Its verdict will always be God's son is innocent and sin does not exist. You see, so now you're taking on the Holy Spirit's opinion of you, which is that you're innocent and that you haven't really done anything, that uh, this negative thinking about yourself is, is needless. Uh, it's erroneous because it's based on a false assumption. And the false assumption was that this was real, that this was true. When the truth is none of it is real, none of it is true, and that's why you're innocent. And then you can go on to the third step, which you're doing for yourself. Now you can think of yourself with what my teachers call spiritual sight, with what the Course calls vision. And you can think of yourself as not being this body. You know, now you're thinking outside the box. You know, now you're going to think of yourself as being this perfect spirit, which is no different than God, which means that you are actually perfect oneness with God. You are God. And this spirit has never uh, been tarnished in any way. It's never been affected in any way. You're still at home with God. Uh, God loves you perfectly and uh, wants to give you everything, the entire kingdom of heaven, which you are worthy of because God gave it to you as a gift. You know, you don't have to earn it. All that you have to do to experience it is exactly what I just said. Those three steps undo the ego. And by undoing the ego and thinking with the Holy Spirit and seeing with this vision that the Course talks about, which is all of it, not part of it, but all of it. Always remember the Course says the Spirit is not a partial attribute. You know, it's all of it. And in thinking of yourself that way, you're undoing your ego. And if you did that, you know, let's say that you did that every night that you went to bed, you know, for 30 days. I think that you would find that you're actually starting to feel different about yourself. So uh, do me a favor and try that. You know, try thinking that way about yourself and you might be surprised. Wonderful. Thank you for the great advice. It's my pleasure. And uh, you know, I want to thank all you guys. And I appreciate you being here. And uh, Jared's a uh, you know, great friend. And uh, you all are. And uh, don't forget to buy the book on Tuesday. If you haven't bought it yet, Tuesday is a great day to buy it because it affects my sales ranking. <laughs> and, uh, oh, we will be. And if, if anybody uh, you know, has any questions about it, I'm sure in a couple of months I'll be back uh, you know, to do another book club thing.
Yes, yes. And Gary, before we end, um, I'm just going to share the screen here on our audio book that Arten and Persa had recommended we listen to next, Living a Course in Miracles. Could you just comment on this uh, for the group? Why uh, maybe ask Arten and Persa to tell us why they want us to hear this one? Yeah, this is a, a great uh, presentation by Ken. It's like, uh, as you see there, it's like nine and a half hours. Yeah. So you're going to get a lot of uh, information from this. Uh, this is Ken at his best. Uh, I remember the first time I saw Ken, it was uh, 1998. And I went to Roscoe, New York, and he was giving a presentation about time. It was called uh, Time and Eternity. And uh, he spoke for like uh, 10 hours over the course of the weekend. And he was just amazing. So he picks a subject, and yes, he talks about that subject. But you get so much uh, information about the course itself uh, when you listen to Ken. It relates to that subject, but it also relates to everything. It relates to the course, your life. And this topic, living a course in miracles, you know, well, how do you live it in your everyday life? Uh, this is a great explanation of that. So uh, I would encourage you and anybody who you tell about it uh, to definitely get into this because it's well worth it. Awesome. Thank you, Gary. We're excited. And, and for everyone who's watching, you just need to basically get a, a 30 day trial of Audible. Or if you already have Audible, just buy a credit and sign up for the $14.95 a month. Because if you do that, then you can get this book for one credit, which was $14.95, instead of paying $52.95, which would be to buy it without a credit. So obviously, um, you see here, me and my wife have zero credits. So we're going to go buy it and get back on the monthly deal. And that's how we're going to get this. But our next call is going to be next Friday, um, Friday the 17th. And we're going to be discussing the first hour of Dr. Ken Wapnick's book, A Living A Course in Miracles. So uh, I just want to encourage you to download that, get it on your phone. I know that you have to download it on your computer and then it shows up on the phone. That's how it works with iPhone. Um, I think Android, it, it works right on your phone. But I know you'll figure it out. Those who, who want to be on it are going to figure it out. But I, I would love to have you on our call next week and all the next nine weeks because we're going to have nine or ten weeks where we listen to this audiobook together. Um, so with that being said, Gary, I really appreciate you. Thank you for all you've done to teach us, to sow into us, to light up our minds with this great, great information. And um, do you have any advice or does Art in person have any advice for us before we end the call? Well, I would say really, uh, you know, be committed to not compromising on these ideas. I think that's uh, the message they're really uh, hammering home in the fourth book. You know, how important it is uh, to stick with it. Uh, yeah, we're going to catch ourselves thinking with the ego from time to time. And that's when we have to be the most vigilant and, and uncompromised. When we say, no, nope, that's my ego. Uh, you know, I, I had a, an imaginary billions of years thinking that way. Uh, now it's time to do something different. And that's just think with the Holy Spirit and really be determined. And uh, that's half the battle right there. It's not how smart you are. It's how determined you are to think with the Holy Spirit. Ooh, I like it. Well, thank you again, Gary. Great advice. And now we're going to finish the call by unmuting all the lines and everyone say, thank you, Gary, and have an awesome night. Thank, thank you, you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Love you. Love you, love you too. Night. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thank you. I love you. Great. We'll see you. Thank you, thank Gary. You. Okay. Thank you, Jared. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, Jared. I love you. <laughs> love you too. I don't know if you know.